All right, good afternoon, everybody. I am Mary Wood, the faculty director of the Environmental and Natural Resources Law Center here at the University of Oregon School of Law. And it will be my privilege very soon to introduce uh, perhaps two incredible people who will help, help set the tone for this afternoon's program, although one is having a few technical difficulties. So we shall see. Um, but after that, our Dean, Jennifer Reynolds, will offer welcoming remarks and introduce our honored lecturer, uh, Director Chuck Sams. But first, I want to just personally thank uh, Director Sams for joining us as the Renard Striction Lecturer. It, it really means so much to me, to our program, to our students, to our law school, and to the community as a whole. Um, of course, there will be a formal summary of Director Sam's many accomplishments. Uh, we can't summarize everything, there's too many. But let me first just say that uh, I have had the honor of working with Director Sam's uh, before he was Director Sam's in the past um, and have always found him to be a truly visionary Native leader who really has no equal, which is why I was so thrilled uh, when he accepted this invitation to be with us today as the Renard Strickland Lecture. Um, I have worked with him specifically through the Morse Center's theme on native sovereignty years ago. Um, and we were envisioning uh, a native environmental sovereignty role uh, particularly in connection with conservation easements and land trusts. And there, there was a group of about 30 of us, I believe. And he, above all, just set the tone for an emboldened and inclusive path forward. And in every interaction I've had with him since then, he did the same. So I can think of absolutely no better speaker who who embodies the values and the legacy that are enshrined in this annual Renard Strickland lecture. So I, I just want to thank Director Sams uh, personally for, for that, for being here with us today. And now um, it is my pleasure to introduce um, one of our uh, speakers joining us who will set the tone for this afternoon's program. And uh, if we are able to get uh, Marta Clifford in as well, please uh, let me know, Maddie, and I, I will then go on to introduce her. Um, but without further ado, uh, I, I believe I will go on to introduce Dr. Kirby Brown, the director of the Department of Native American and Indigenous Studies and an associate professor in the Department of English here at the University of Oregon. Dr. Brown is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and focuses his research and teaching on Native American literary, intellectual, and cultural production from the late 18th century to the present, as well as indigenous critical theory and studies in sovereignty, self-determination, nationhood, and nationalism, modernism, and mo modernity in genre. A formidable scholar, Dr. Brown is author of the award-winning book, Stoking the Fire, Nationhood in Cherokee Writing. And he is also co-editor on the also award-winning uh, publication, The Routledge Handbook to North American Indigenous Modernisms. So thank you, Dr. Brown, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. Thank you so much for that introduction, Mary. And I'm just excited to uh, echo all of the words of welcome uh, to Director Sams uh, for joining us today as, as the uh, this year's speaker for the Renard Strickland Lecture. Uh, normally, in, if we're meeting in person, we would be either at the law school or uh, maybe even in the Many Nations Longhouse. And so I'm kind of virtually attempting to bring that a little bit of that amazing space and the magic of that space into the into the uh, into the room here today. So uh, I'm not in the Longhouse, but I'm channeling the Longhouse with my virtual backgrounds here. 
Um, usually when we, uh, when we welcome folks to campus, particularly in an event like this, um, we acknowledge that all of us are fundamentally changed when we come together, that at its best, the academy, and at its best, when we share knowledge with one another, um, we leave changed people, uh, and we do that for each other. Um, so we offer a song that our former um, steward of the Many Nations Longhouse, the original steward of our Longhouse, Gordon Bettles, who is a Klamath tribal member and also a University of Oregon alum, gifted us with this song. Um, and it's a Klamath song. Uh, Gordon received it from an elder who, who um, asked only one thing of him to gift him the song. She said, this is a song that's meant to be shared. Um, so this song doesn't have any restrictions, no seasonal restrictions. Um, single communities or families don't own it. Um, and it's meant to be shared anytime we come into a space uh, where we're, we're coming together with open hearts and open minds um, and, and sharing knowledge with one another. And so um, the vocables are Hoena, Hoenawenia, and roughly translated, they mean I change you, you change me. And so this is a song about coming into relationship and coming into community and being uh, uh, changed by that, uh, by that interaction. And I know we're all going to leave uh, fundamentally changed today by the, by the work uh, that Director Sands shares with us. Um, so I'm going to sing it through uh, uh, three times, uh, a cappella on the fourth, and then a final fifth time. For those of you who know it, feel free to sing along with me uh, with your mics muted just so we don't uh, overlap with one another. Uh, but I invite anyone who knows it from wherever you're streaming from to, uh, to join me in the, in the song. Thank you so much. Uh, that was wonderful and really helps us set the tone for this afternoon. And I am delighted to say that I believe I've been informed that Marta Clifford has been able to join. And so she will say an opening prayer. Uh, but first, let me introduce Marta Clifford. She is Chinook and Cree member of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, whose service to our community is truly invaluable. She is active in local efforts to support the global movement for missing and murdered indigenous women, including by helping to organize a poetry in the park event to honor these women each year. A very talented storyteller and actress, Marta serves as co-instructor for the University of Oregon's Department of Theater Arts and as a tribal elder in residence for the U of O's Native American and Indigenous Studies Academic Residential Community. Marta, thank you for gracing us with your presence today. And we will see if the technology works. We see Marta. We don't hear Marta yet. 
So perhaps if you look for a mic button and unmute it. And I think it might be at the top to the left of the red leave button. Still don't know. So we still don't hear you, Marta. At least I don't. Um, could you look for the mic button, which is two over to the left from the red leave button? Unfortunately, we don't hear you. Um, we may have to go on to our introduction. I am so sorry if we figure this out right after the introduction from Dean Reynolds. Uh, perhaps we could bring you back in. Um, but I'm inclined, given the technical difficulty right now, to go on to Dean Reynolds for the introduction of our honored speaker. And then I would ask um, our team uh, if, if um, Marta is able to use the microphone, let me know. Dean Reynolds. Oh, well, Dr. Brown, thank you so much for that beautiful performance. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Wood, for the introduction. And I do hope we get to see Marta's performance. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be with you today. My name is Jen Reynolds. I'm a professor and the interim dean at the University of Oregon School of Law. On behalf of Oregon Law, the Environmental and Natural Resources Law Center, and the Native Environmental Sovereignty Project, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 18th annual Renard Strickland Lecture. The legacy of the Renard Strickland Lecture Series would not be what it is without the support of our partners, including the UO Department of Native American and Indigenous Studies, the Native American Law Students Association, and the Wayne Moore Center for Law and Politics. We appreciate these partners as well as the students, faculty, staff, and community members who are as eager as we are for this afternoon's event. In keeping with the Indigenous protocol and practice of acknowledging the original peoples of the land we now occupy, I would like to begin by noting that we here at the university are gathered on Kalapuya Ilihi, the traditional ancestral homeland and cultural center of the Kalapuya peoples. And wherever you are in what many today call Oregon, you are on the traditional homelands of the Burns Paiute tribe, the Confederated tribes of the Coos, Lower Umpqua and Siuslaw Indians, the Confederated tribes of Siletz Indians, the Confederated tribes of Grand Ronde, the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, the Coquel Indian Tribe, the Calcrete Band of Umqua Tribe of Indians, the Klamath Tribes, and nations and peoples with sacred landed connections. Today, many Kalapuya descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde and the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians. These nations and their citizens, as well as those whose ancestral connections are not federally recognized, continue to make significant contributions to our communities, the University of Oregon, the Eco Region, and the world. Before introducing our speaker, let me say a few words about Renard Strickland. An Osage citizen of the Cherokee Nation, Strickland was widely regarded as a national leader in Indian law and one of the founders of the field. Throughout his lifetime, he published more than 40 books and authored numerous articles and book chapters. He served as editor-in-chief of the 1982 revision of Cohen's Handbook on Federal Indian Law and was a member of the editorial board of the 2005 revision. A legend in the field of legal education, Strickland held leadership roles in the American Association of Law Schools and the Society of American Law Teachers. Here at Oregon Law, Strickland served as dean and professor. In both roles, he contributed to our environmental and natural resources and Indian law programs. In recognition of his accomplishments, the ENR Center's Native Environmental Sovereignty Project created the Renard Strickland Lecture Series in 2006. This series is rooted in Strickland's vision, which can be summarized by the following quote from his book, Tonto's Revenge. If there is to be a post-Columbian future, a future for any of us, it will be an Indian future. Indeed, indigenous epistemologies and tribal sovereignty are essential to all our futures. 
I'm now honored to introduce this afternoon's speaker, Charles F. Chuck Sams. Cayuse and Walla Walla, Chuck Sams is an enrolled member of the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, northeast of here, where he grew up. He also has blood ties to the Kukupa Tribe and Yankton Sioux of Fort Peck. On December 16, 2021, he was ceremonially sworn in as the 19th director of the National Park Service by Interior Secretary Deb Holland, becoming the first indigenous person in US history to hold this office. For 30 years, Director Sams has worked in tribal and state government and in the nonprofit natural resource and conservation management field with an emphasis on the responsibility of strong stewardship for land preservation for this and future generations. Before his appointment as the director of the National Park Service, he served as Oregon Governor Kate Brown's appointee to the Pacific Northwest Power and Conservation Council. Prior to joining the council, Director Sam served his community as executive director for the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. Director Sams is a veteran of the US Navy where he served as an intelligence specialist. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration from Concordia University and a Master of Legal Studies in Indigenous Peoples Law from the University of Oklahoma School of Law. We are so grateful that Director Sams has agreed to share his time, energy, and ideas with our community this afternoon. Please join me in virtually welcoming Director Sams to present his talk, Fulfilling the Covenant, Stewardship of America's Best Idea, the Intersection of Indigenous Knowledge and the 1916 Organic Act. Welcome. Well, thank you, Dean Reynolds. I am so very, very pleased and honored to be with you all today. Good day, my friends and relatives. My Indian name is Mockingbird with Big Heart, and I come from the place of the Big Springs on the Umatilla Indian Reservation, and I am a keeper of the salmon. The first time I heard Renard, Le Renard Strickland lecture was 30 years ago this past spring while attending the University of Oregon in a class that was being taught by Winona LaDuke. Renard captured me right away in his lecture because I could see a future where you would not have to give up the principles and your ideals of understanding the natural law that you were given as a native person, but how to marry that with the now common laws of the United States. And he was the inspiration for which I ended up eventually going and getting a law degree, albeit a master's in federal Indian law, so that I could understand that intersection and better be able to interpret for my own people and for myself how that intersection exists. And so today, I'm so very honored to be joining you and Mary Wood, who's a very dear friend. We've done a number of projects, including bringing back Chum onto her own family's property and the creek nearby, and a number of projects over the years and pushing tribal sovereignty and getting a better understanding of how tribes can be more self-determined. And so I'm going to share with you a lecture that I've set up. I will be honest, uh, since I normally, I, prior to joining uh, federal service again, I, um, was an adjunct professor at the Georgetown University in the School of Foreign Service. So as a college lecturer, I sometimes can go very windy. So I'm going to try to go very quickly through a number of information here so that we'll have time for questions and answers at the end. But what I want to talk about is this covenant and where does it come from and where does it exist? As I said, I grew up in Northeast Oregon on the Umatilla Indian Reservation. And as I understand it, there was a time, of course, when only the animals lived on the earth itself. And when those animals lived on the earth in the time before humans, there was a time when the monster came, Nishla. Nishla lived on the, what is now called the Columbia River and what we call the Nichiwana or the Big River. And as he come awake, he decided that he was going to eat up everything in the known world. And he began drinking all of the water and eating the cliff sides. He began also looking and trying to eat up all of the animals that were on the landscape. The animals were calling out and the plant people were calling out to Coyote for help. Coyote could see as he stood on top of the mountain all the things that Nishla, the monster, was eating. So he went to the Huckleberry sisters and he told them, this thing, this monster is eating all of the known world. What should I do? They whispered in his ear and he could hear them. And he went and decided he knew that he had to do to, in order to protect all of the living creatures on the world. So he went and he gathered three sticks and he sharpened those sticks. He gathered some fire making materials and he put those all together and he made sure that he had taunted the monster until the monster came up out of the water 
and ate him too. As he was making his way through the monster's bowels into the bowels of the monster, the, all the animals, he could see their eyes calling out, Coyote, is that you? Coyote, is that you? Cougar was calling out. Eagle was calling out. The couch, the camp plant people were calling out. And Coyote said, yes, show me and tell me, how do I get to his heart? Coyote made his way to the heart of the monster. There, he built a big, big fire so that he could see the work at hand. And then he took those sticks and he sawed away at the heart of the monster until finally, in a last gasp, he was able to cut the heart and it fell onto the fire, causing the heart to catch on fire. The monster began to cough out and he coughed everything up that he'd swallowed back onto the landscape, coughing out the birds, coughing out the snakes, coughing out all the animals, coughing back up the water, out it went, until finally he coughed so hard that his heart flew out and he died. All the animals were back on the landscape and all the animals, or as we call them, the people, were thankful for the coyote. In the picture on the lower left in that montage of pictures there is the heart of the monster, which is located up in Nez Perce country. We know this story and it's taught to us from a young age for those of us who are from the Columbia Plateau. My cousins, the Nez Perce, the Yakima, the Warm Springs people. And we are taught that coyote, through coyote, we must become smart. We must be creative and we must use our strengths. And most importantly, we must always be able to band together in order to protect ourselves in case the monster ever returns. In our own creation story, we've learned that uh, my eyesight is from eagle, my skin is from elk. When creator was creating this thing called human, he called coyote up to Pato or what is now Mount Adams in Washington state. And when coyote climbed to the very top, he called up to Creator and said, I'm here, Creator, what can I do for you? And Creator passed down a medicine bag and he says, I need you to go and collect gifts from all the other people on the earth so I can create this thing called human. This is a good thing. So Coyote began to glissade down the mountain. When he looked up, he saw an eagle and he yelled out to Eagle, this thing called human is coming. Creator wants to know what kind of gift you can give. Eagle said, I'll give part of my eyesight. So this way, this thing called human will be able to see the splendors and the beauties of the earth. This is a good gift. He continued his way down the mountain and as he got to the edge of the forest, he looked up into the trees and there was an owl and he yelled out to owl, owl, this thing called human is coming. What gift can you give? Owl said, I'll give part of my hearing. So he'll be able to hear the wahli or the wind. He'll be able to hear the sounds of the water. He'll be hear the sounds of the other living creatures on the earth. This too is a good gift and he put it in his medicine bag. As he came into the meadow, he looked into the meadow and he saw all the plant people, the wild carrots, the wild strawberries, the couch, the roots, and he yelled out to them, plant people, this thing called human is coming and creator wants to know if you can give a gift. The plant people said, we will give part of our root system. So this way it will have a system by which to nourish, nourish itself, to carry out the energy that must flow through it and the water to protect its body. This is a great gift. All along the way, as Coyote made his way down the mountain, he was getting all of these gifts until he finally got to the Nichiwana, near a place called Salilo Falls, or the echoing the water. There, salmon were returning, and salmon were jumping up and over the falls. And through the roar of the falls, Coyote yelled out to the salmon, Salmon, this thing called human is coming, and Creator wants to know if you can give a gift. Salmon eddied out and popped its head up and says, I'm going to give two gifts. One, I'm going to give of my voice completely. This way, this thing called human will have a voice and can talk and communicate with each other. It's where we would believe that we get the Chinook jargon that goes all the way from the mouth of the Columbia River all the way to its headwaters in Canada. Second, Salmon says, I will give up of my body completely. This way, the human will be able to nourish itself. But before I give these things up, I ask Creator to create a covenant with this thing called human, that it will protect the flora and fauna, that will protect us and that it will be our steward. This is the gifts that we give and in return what we expect. This is the covenant. This is the promise that those of us from the Columbia Plateau come from and we're told that we must be good stewards of these resources, all of the natural resources, that we must have a relationship with them and it must be a reciprocating relationship. I've had the good fortune of traveling around Indian country and I've heard many creation stories throughout the Pacific Northwest and throughout the United States, into Canada and into Northern Mexico. 
And I hear many thoughts through those creation stories that center around the ideas of being good stewards of the resources and that we understand that the earth is what made us. The water is sacred and what makes us who we are as human beings. As I said, I come from the Confederated Tribes of Umatilla Indian Reservation. And so in the beginning, we understand our covenant and our covenant is what we call Tamunwit or literally in our language means to be stood up, which is what we create. It is the master law. It is the law of the land that we must always be good stewards in everything that we do. And to chum, which is our land, that we must protect our land and our people because our land is our people. We also come from a paradigm where we understood that we actually had limited wants with unlimited resources. My grandfather drilled that into me time and time again as we walked along the banks of the Umatilla River on Meacham Creek, on Sculpa Creek, Buckaroo Creek, that we really as human beings have limited wants. We want food, we want shelter, we want heat, we want a relationship with the land and the creatures upon it, including our fellow human beings. Of course, I have a business degree that tells me the exact opposite. It says that I have unlimited wants with limited resources. But the paradigm I grew up with and the paradigm that I try to live by is having limited wants and understanding I have unlimited resources. And to get there though, in today's word, world, we have to figure out how we're gonna restore our balance because, because by restoring our balance, we'll restore our lands. And what so many people have called wilderness, I've called home. As I said, I've had the good fortune of traveling around the country a lot and visiting a number of indigenous peoples and in, in, in their home places, including in Australia and overseas and Finland and many other places. Most people of indigenous ancestry don't even have a word for wilderness. It's very interesting. In my own, we don't have. The closest we have is skukum, which is a Chinook jargon word, which just means something that's not straight. But we really have no thing called for wilderness because wilderness is our home. And I've learned how to negotiate my life based on the Treaty of 1855 when my people gave up 6.4 million acres of land and reserved a half a million acres for themselves. Action of the United States while also upholding the United States and protecting the United States against their enemies. The ideals, though, that we talk about really stands around what is land tenure. And one has to understand the ideals of land tenure that came into conflict when we started to be, when we, when Europeans and other foreign powers started coming in the United States. And the ideas that really pitted themselves was the ideals between land stewardship versus land ownership. There's also a dispute about when time began and understanding the continuum sense of time immemorial that our memory is longer and our understanding of the world is passed down generation to generation through oral history and oral storytelling. And it is no different, even if it's not written down. And that each of us has a promise and the law. And what is that promise that we make? And what are the laws that we keep in order to function as human beings? And understanding time, that we as native people have been here for at least 30,000 years on land versus the 500 years since the discovery of this new world as it came for the Europeans and other like-minded folks. What's interesting to me is that as a kid in the 1970s growing up, I remember coming home around fourth grade and telling my grandfather I'd learned that the native people have been here for 10,000 years. And he laughed and he said, we've been here for at least 30,000 years. By the time I graduated high school in the 1980s, the scientists said, oh, native people have been here between 12 and 14,000 years. By the time I was attending classes at U of O in 93 and 94, it had been decided that between 14 and 16,000. By the early 2000s, it was 16 to 18. And now at in White Sands National Park, we've learned that people have been here between 26 and 30,000 years. I wish my grandfather was alive because I know if I said to him, we now know, or I should say, the dominant society now knows we've been here for at least 30,000 years. He would have said all they had to do was ask us and we would have told them. So what is this conflict that we have with this discovery? What is this ideal that we have a conflict in mind when it becomes between understanding land stewardship versus land ownership? It really sets itself in the doctrine of discovery in two particular papal bulls. The 1452 Papal Bull, which declared by divine intention, Europeans, Christian countries gain power and rights over indigenous non-Christian people. And the 1493 Inter Satera, Pope Alexander VI grants to Spain, which was a retro grant because of the discovery of the new world of the right to conquer the new world. In this picture, we see, of course, what must be done under a Christian mindset. One, 
they must plant their nation flag state their flag into the ground to declare that they want to conquer these lands they plant a sword in the ground saying this they will fight and defend and they will read from their black book and if anybody understands the latin they're reading according to the 1493 papal bull then the land cannot be discovered by the dominant society and must be turned back over but since as they went into these countries and no one spoke latin nobody understood these words that were being spoken and therefore this gave the new folks coming into the landscape their divine right to control and conquest this this world from that point on we talk about the indian experience and most of us grew up in a traditional school setting in which we learned about you know pre-colonial times the colonial period uh, the revolutionary period the antebellum period the civil war period the reconstruction period that's the normal in indian country we have a bit different experience when i look at my own timeline i talk about the time since time immemorial to 1491 and that was where the majority of my education came from the understanding from oral traditions of our relationship on this landscape that has been grown for nearly 30,000 years and for native people we see then a different timeline really the 1492 to 1828 colonial period the 1828 to 1887 removal reservation and treaty period the 1887 to 1934 allotment and assimilation period the 1934 to 45 indian reorganization period the 1945 to 1968 termination period and of course 1968 to now the self-determination period though scholars are arguing amongst themselves right now that sometime probably in the early 2000s we moved partially out of the self-determination period into tribal nation building but that's still a scholarly debate that's going on i normally teach a federal indian or an indian course on this uh, but we don't have time to go through each of those each of these time periods will reflect on how we get to modern conservation and the promise that we're actually trying to fulfill today in protecting and preserving these resources that we've set aside for ourselves as american citizens in that time period here are just 40 federal indian policies there are well over 10 times that amount on federal law. These federal acts are what Native people end up living by. These federal acts were not written necessarily to support or help Native people as much as a way to control them, have dominance over them, and control their lives. Many of these laws still exist today, and tribal governments the world over in the United States, across the United States, have to figure out how to live within these laws and see which ones actually apply to them and which don't all depending on what the treaty rights that they've reserved for themselves or what rights they may observe reserve for themselves if they're an executive order tribe but through all of that we talk about conservation and what does conservation mean in the united states in the early years of conservation george catlin's proposal as he said was to do some great protecting policy of government that preserve a large expanse of land in all its pristine beauty and wilderness where the world could see for the ages to come the native Indian in classic attire galloping on his horse amid fleeing herds of elk and buffalo. So George Catlin and several others like David Thoreau who said the eloquent savage uses nature as a symbol. He looks around him in the woods to aid his expression, his language, though more flowery is less artificial. What Indians have a word for, they have a thing for. Catlin and Thoreau had envisioned conservation where these lands would be set aside by the United States, but where native people would continue to live their lives as they had had for ages before. And yet, by the time when we start in modern conservation at the turn of the last century, John Muir is, is quoted as Indians as diggers, fallen, ugly, some of them altogether hideous, and that there's no place on the landscape. Former Pre President Teddy Roosevelt had said, the rude, fierce settler who drives the savage from the land lays all civilized mankind under a debt to him. It's incalculable importance that America, Australia, and Siberia should pass out of the hands of the red, black, and yellow Aboriginal owners and become the heritage of the dominant world races. It's that conservation ideals that had, that took control for nearly a hundred years in the United States. There was no understanding that the relationship that native people had to the landscape as the Kuna chief said, the land is our culture. Owahi said, God named this land for us. And Maninika the Yakima said, my strength is from the fish, my blood is from the fish, from the roots and berries. The fish and game are the essence of my life. I was not brought here from foreign country. It did not come here. I was put here by the creator. In Barry Lopez's book, The Rediscovery of America, 
He ends the book with an interesting point, but he starts by talking about the imposition, the European imposition of their will was an incursion with no proposal to the natives of the land. But he closes the book by saying, we must turn to each other and sense that this is possible. The possible is what can we do to be better stewards? I had the good fortune of working with the late Barry Lopez and lecturing with him at Yale University. And we talked about what we could do to teach each other to be better stewards, to understand that the lessons that I've been taught as a child must continue to be taught to everyone in the United States in a way that would help us better protect lands. Because as you see, when modern conservation came about nearly 150 years ago at Yellowstone, it was the removal of Indians off of those sites. 1914, the removal of the Pomo Indians off of Yosemite. The 1916 Organic Act doesn't actually call out for Indian removal, but by the time we passed the Wilderness Act in 64, there's still a push to remove Indians who might still be on the landscape of public lands that are held in common with the United States. And the last of the Indian settlements was raised in 1969 in Yosemite. The Nature Conservancy, the Conservation Fund, the Trust for Public Land, which I work for, and Columbia Land Trust locally in the Pacific Northwest, who I was an advisor from, all had some of these original ideals of the previous understanding of conservation, but over the last 20 years have learned to grow and become much more expansive in their thought process of how to work with Native people if they're going to conserve the lands for future generations. The 1916 Organic Act that established the National Park Service. The service thus established shall promote and regulate the use of federal areas known as national parks, monuments, and reservations, and hereafter specified by such means and measures as conforms to the fundamental purpose of the said parks, monuments, and reservations, which purpose is to conserve the scenery and the natural and historic objects and the wildlife therein, and provide for the enjoyment of the same in such manner and by such means as will leave them unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. There are people who will say that those are two conflicting values, but I don't see them as such. In the original law that I was given, it's an understanding that we must be good stewards of these resources, of the flora and fauna, and the protection of our culture. And we don't just do this for ourselves, we do it for the generations yet unborn, the next seven generations to come. And so when I was asked to be the 19th director of the National Park Service, I was very, very thrilled to actually bring my own ethos and understanding of the world that actually matched many of the words that were written in the 1916 Organic Act. Now, the National Park Service. When I joined the National Park Service, I was sworn in as director on uh, December 17th, 2021, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Secretary Holland called and asked where I wanted to be sworn in because most people had been being sworn in in her ceremonial large office. And she knew that I most likely would like to do it outside. And I said, yes, I would like to do it outside and I would like to do it at the Lincoln Memorial. And I chose the Lincoln Memorial because it was the first time I saw it was in 1989 as a young sailor while I was stationed in Southern Virginia. And the words within the temple of the Lincoln Memorial are inscribed both the second inaugural address and the Gettysburg address. And those words have stuck with me about if there's going to be a division in this country, it's probably not going to be a power from the outside that hurts us, it's, but it's going to be our own power within. And for year after year, when I'd come back to Washington to do business, I would come back to that temple to read those words. I would also recognize that Lincoln, as a president, who I believe was a great man, also was a flawed man, but he understood his flaws. He knew that he had a limited education, and yet, as he, because he learned how to read, he made sure to be a ferocious reader. He learned how to become a lawyer. He had many, many setbacks, but he didn't allow those setbacks to stop him from progressing. He learned from each one of those flaws and he made it his strength in the end. I recognize that he also killed some of my relatives, the Dakota 38, and the decision that he had to make by the, from the 360 that were supposed to be killed and coming down to 38. And the complexity of being able to suppress one group of human beings while freeing another. Those complexities were never lost on me, but I also understood that he was a learner and he was willing to change his ideas as information came into him. So I chose to be sworn in on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. It was a cold December day when we walked up to the steps and I wanted to be literally standing inside the temple when the secretary said we were going to stop on the second landing. 
her staff tried to point out that I had already wanted to step on the top landing, and she was insistent that we stop at the second landing. Then she asked everybody to step away. We looked out in that very nice crisp December morning, and she said, on behalf of the President of the United States, the American people, and myself, I am charging you to protect and preserve these national parks, monuments, and memorials. And I charge you with telling America's story fiercely to find those stories not yet told so that every American can see a reflection of themselves in our national parks. Then she said, would you please look at your feet? I looked around wondering, why would I look at my feet? And then I looked down and I was standing on the spot. It's engraved where Dr. King gave his 1963, I have a dream speech. And she said, Chuck, you and I are the embodiment of Dr. King's dream. That lives with me today and understanding that we must continue to fight to, to perfect a more perfect union and that we must tell America's stories, the good, the bad, and the ugly. The National Park Service has a very dedicated staff and I couldn't think of a better organization to come and be a, a part of and to lead. There are 431 parks, monuments, memorials, and historic sites. When I joined the service, there were 424. This administration has built upon that to bring in additional parks all across, to new ones and monuments. We have 85 million acres of land that we are federal stewards of on behalf of the American people. We have over 71,000 different pieces of assets, of roads, of bridges, of vehicles, and others. We have over $170 billion in value of those resources. 21,000 dedicated staff provide the support in those parks day in and day out. There are 25,000 concessionaires that help provide other amenities to the people that come in the parks. And many Americans don't know, there are nearly 280,000 active volunteers. And it's not without these volunteers, we wouldn't be able to get nearly the amount of work that needs to be done in order to protect and preserve these lands that we've set aside for ourselves as Americans. Coming into the service, I wanted to ensure that it was about people, that it was important that we understand that if we have a workforce that is healthy and happy, we will have an organization that's healthy and happy. Because among my own people, there was a saying when I was little that the elders would say in Indian, that only when you are healthy and happy can the people be healthy and happy. And I understood that the workforce that I was dealing with was not very happy at the time period. And so we needed to work to ensure that they were a healthy and happy organization and a people as individuals so that they can contribute to that mission. And so when I laid out my director's orders coming into the administration, I made sure it was about connecting and empowering a thriving and diverse workforce, that we were going to invest in the future of parks, which means we were going to invest in not just things, but in our people, that we were gonna confront the climate crisis using science and traditional ecological knowledge in stewarding our resources, that we would advance equity, inclusion, and access in carrying out the National Park Service's mission, that we would respect and strengthen indigenous connections and enhance our nation to nation relationships and truly uphold our trust and treaty responsibilities. That we would create a National Park Service experience that meets visitors' expectation, not just now, but into the future, because we need to look from seven generations from now. And that we needed to greatly improve, streamline, and modernize the National Park Service's management and business practices to ensure accountability to ourselves, our partners, the American people, and, and many, many others. Growing up in the 90s under the Clinton administration, President Clinton was looking to build upon what President Nixon had started in 1970 and figuring out how we were to have be better partners with tribes. In his original documentation that he laid out, he put out an executive order, uh, 12, executive order 12875, enhancing intergovernmental partnerships, which really laid the groundwork of how to work with tribes and how to ensure that there weren't unfunded mandates that were being placed with tribal governments. It ultimately led to the, two, the 1998 Executive Order 13084, but that was annulled in 2000 with Executive Order 13175, which called for the consultation and coordination with tribal governments. And it set the groundwork by which all federal agencies were to have consultation policies and understanding and how to work with tribes. Between 1995 until 2000, 
I'd spent a lot of time in Washington, D.C. advocating on behalf of my own tribe and many others about government to government relationships. And I was surprised by how long it took many of the federal agencies, especially within the Department of Interior, to come up with consultation policies. So you can imagine my surprise that all those years later, and when I came in in 2021 to this job, the last holdout on having formal consultation policies was the National Park Service. I'm happy to report that we will be shortly publishing, finally, the tribal consultation policies under Director Order Number 70C, in which we will finally have those priorities set out that we ensure that we are consulting with tribes on a government to government basis. Early on, this administration understood the importance of doing just that. Under Secretary or, or Joint Secretary Order 3403, the Departments of Interior, Agriculture and Commerce came together and did a fulfilling trust responsibility to Indian tribes in the stewardship of federal lands and waters. For the first time, it was called out among these three federal agencies that we would look on how do, to do co-stewardship with tribes, how we could use annual funding agreements, how we could use general operating agreements, how could we use 638 contracting and other opportunities to work directly with tribes. And that happened in the year 2021. In December of 2022, we recognized in when we were looking at how to build up partnerships with tribes during co-stewardship that we needed to bring uh, definitions. And so in December of 2022, the White House Council on Environmental Quality and the White House Office of Science and Technology published the Indigenous Knowledge Guidance for Federal Agencies. And I was very happy to be part of a team that helped those two agencies, to those two offices, come up with those definitions of what Indigenous knowledge is from an indigenous perspective and how we were going to apply it equally all across federal agencies. In December of 2023, that came out from the White House, the best practices guides for federal agencies regarding tribal and native Hawaiian sacred sites and how we were gonna live up to our responsibilities both under the Native American Graves Repatriation Act and under our cultural resource programming throughout federal agencies, but in particularly in the National Park Service with additional guidelines and director's intent. And then, in 2024, uh, Executive Order 14112, reforming federal funding and support for tribal nations to better embrace our trust responsibilities and promote next era of tribal self-determination was laid out on how we were going to be able to work with tribes on federal funding to ensure that we maximized the money that was coming in on restoration and ecosystem function work was happening across all the different bureaus within the federal government, but in particularly how I could use that language from that executive order to ensure that the National Park Service was living up to its trust responsibility. So where are we at today? These are the executive orders that have come out. These are what's helping us and guide the National Park Service. And each of these that come out from either the president and or the secretary and or Congress, I sent out director's intent, and the director's intent gives the legal structure by which we will follow these guidances, which we will follow these laws to ensure that we're upholding trust responsibility to its fullest effect. For far too long, then I spent 30 years of my career mostly throwing rocks at the Department of Interior. So it was a surprise to me when I got asked to come on the inside and become part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And all across, federal agencies within the Department of Interior, I've seen this movement to be better stewards and better active partners with tribes. In the National Park Service, there's a generation of young rangers who are eager to work with tribes all across the United States into retelling their tribal stories, not of just their past, but who they are today and what those stories talk about and how to care for and steward these lands and these resources out of the 431 parks across the nation. Some of the accomplishments that we've been able to do in, under this administration over the last three and a half plus years, we now have a memorandum of agreement with all these caldera fencing in which we're now working with the tribe to ensure that cattle are kept off the land to protect traditional foods and cultural resources. We published an updated na native plant gathering policy so that tribes can actually protect their usual custom rights and be able to still follow the guidelines and, and the legal doctrines under NEPA but without having to map out those areas in particular so that they can protect where they've been collecting native plants for both food and medicine resources. We were able to work with Indian Affairs in updating the NAGPRA regulations to have a better understanding that when the decision-making about 
the remains that are found, the, the remains that are being held by federal institutions and other resources, that it's the tribes who are determining cultural affiliation and not the federal government determining who cultural affiliation. In the updated regulations, I believe we got nearly 95% of all the things we wanted in Indian country to be updated. That last 5% is going to take Congress to do, and hopefully we'll be able to have a federal Congress to update NAGPRA at some point down the future. In the National Park Service, when I first came in, there were only five co-stewardship agreements in the National Park Service, and all those were federally mandated. Today, we have over 104 co-stewardship agreements with another 50 pending that should be closed, that we should have contractually obligated by the end of this calendar year, which will put us at over 154 co-stewardship agreements with tribes across the United States. That's over one third of national parks will have agreements with tribal governments. We finally fully staffed the Office of Native American Affairs. The Native Office of Native American Affairs, which began several years ago, had usually maybe one person, and that was a collateral duty. We now have several staff members who was their full time duty is to work on Native American affairs issue out of the office of the director. And they have the empowered to work across all the regions within the National Park Service to ensure that liaisons are being provided with tribes so that there's a better understanding of what tribes are trying to bring to the table. We have been doing a number of theme studies, one on women, because we need to uplift more women. There's just not enough storytelling about women in the national parks and about Native Americans. And we chose the time period of uh, the Indian Reorganization Act of the 1930s up to the 1940s as a theme study to talk about the birth of modern tribal government. We are working very hard on getting out the Land and Water Conservation Fund uh, that we have been appropriated. Nearly $900 million a year comes in the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Over $600 million of that is given out by the National Park Service to help in conservation acquisitions with states and counties and conservation partners across the United States. We've revamped the program so we look and act more like a foundation and a little bit less like government bureaucracy because we want to ensure that the money gets out there so that people can actually get these lands set aside for future generations. Coming into the National Park Service, it was exciting to come in under the Great American Outdoors Act. For the first time, the National Park Service had real money to tackle their deferred maintenance. We have over $22 billion in deferred maintenance across the National Park Service. This money has, has given us over $6.5 billion to really start tackling that. We're hoping for a renewal of the Great American Outdoors Act, but we'll see what Congress wants to do. But to date, we've gotten on and done projects in all 50 states, all five U.S. territories, all across National Park Service in getting large and small projects done in order to modernize our systems and our facilities and our trails and our visitor centers. We really stood up the federal inner, uh, our uh, federal partners have all come together to interagency uh, council on outdoor recreation to talk on how we're imagining ensuring that federal lands that we administer uh, all across the both the Department of Interior and Department of Agriculture and the Department of Defense, those recreation lands are being opened up to all Americans so that each American will find a way to be able to get into these uh, recreation lands. We continue to work on air tour management and ensuring that the air tours that we believe should and can happen over national parks, though aren't disturbing, disturbing cultural resources. We've been updating our visitor use management policy. In the last 10 years, we've seen a 20% increase into our national parks. Today, we have over 350 million visitors into the National Park Service and the National Park System. We have updated our law enforcement and talking about how we modernize our law enforcement to ensure that they have all the tools to deal with some of the social issues that we are seeing that are happening in parks, to ensure that our law enforcement are active and are partners with the Park Service in every way. We've been able to bring back prescribed burns that Native people have been using for thousands of years. We've been doing that at Great Smoky Mountains with the Cherokee Nation, Eastern Band of the Cherokee. We've been doing that in Yosemite Park with the Pomo Indians. We've been doing that in the Cascade Range with the tribes all along the Cascades. We are bringing back prescribed burns so that we can actually have a healthier forest system throughout the National Park Service and its 85 million acres of land. We're also looking at how to better deal with structural fires because we've lost in the last several years nearly over $300 million in structural fires. And we continue to work with the Federal Public Health Service to ensure that there's cool, clean water within the national parks so that people will be able to find that water as they continue to travel and be able to use that water. These are the things we're building out in order to help accomplish new goals and objectives by ensuring that the director's orders that the national park system has are up to date 
that our policy memoranda that we are developing are also a step down policies that we were just talking about earlier that come from both the executive order and from the uh, secretarial orders from Secretary Holland. Everything from ideals about how to reduce single use plastics and ensuring that we are doing that reduction and how we're working with our concessionaires, ensuring that there are water refilling stations and that people are using those to actively be able to, to reduce the amount of plastics that are coming in and out of our national parks. We're working to realign uh, a number of priorities to ensure that when we are doing um, the Inflation Reduction Act provided us nearly $250 million to battle climate change and figuring out how not to just mitigate, but how to build resilient infrastructure for future generations as we see the acceleration of climate change happening all across the service. Because the service has been around 100 years, we have a lot of data points and can point to the acceleration of climate change and what we are doing to combat climate change. And we we're looking, as we, as the secretary had told me to do, to be better storytellers, to tell a more inclusive story, to tell more stories about people, whether it is the uh, Chinese American experience in building out the railroads in the West, and where is that in our national parks, and what is that story, and why hasn't it been told more loudly? How we're talking about our civil rights movement, both for the African American, but also for the Hispanic community. We're working on accessibility to ensure that Americans can get into their parks. The last time we had major infrastructure done was in the 1960s, and that was well before the 1990 American Disabilities Act. And so now we're putting these into place. And we continue to work on how we can uphold Aboriginal rights. Most recently, you may have seen in the 10th Circuit, there was a court case that began in 2012 with the Jemez tribe, Jemez Pueblo that eventually ended up in Jemez versus United States 63 F 4th 881, also known as Jemez 2, where the 10th Circuit has upheld that the uh, rights of the tribe under the Treaty of Hidalgo were not extinguished and that those Aboriginal rights to the land still exist. And therefore, 3,035 acres out of the 89,900 acres of the Valles Caldera National Preserve must be co-managed with the tribe in hand because they never lost their Aboriginal rights to those lands. These are new ideals that are finally coming to fruition but to understand that tribes have reserved rights and usual custom rights in these lands, and because of their experience on the landscape over the last 30,000 years, that they can help bring Indigenous knowledge to the forebear as we continue to tackle the issues around climate change. And with that, I would like to open it up for questions. Up in the upper on left there is my late grandfather, Charles F. Sam Sr., fishing at Celilo Falls before it was dammed shortly after the war in 1946. Uh, thank you, Director Sams, for that powerful, brilliant, and just immensely insightful and inspiring lecture. It was, it was really a profound experience uh, for me, and I'm sure everybody else, to hear the ancient native worldview of the Columbia River Basin tribes um, that really grounds uh, through a creation story, the covenant across the land and to have such a high official in the, uh, administration um, express this covenant uh, is truly historic as a covenant across the land. Um, so let me say your lecture was was a pinnacle uh, for the Renard lecture, Strickland Lecture Series, and I just want to thank you so much. And for those of you who would like to uh, see a recording later and share it with others, we will have that up on our event page as soon as we can. And now, indeed, it is time for questions, and I will take questions from the audience. Um, they can submit the questions and they'll pop up and I'll see them. But I did want to start us off with a couple of questions from our student research fellows for the Native Environmental Sovereignty Project. So the first one uh, is uh, this year, we are focusing our research on Apache Stronghold versus United States. How does the National Park Service work to protect sacred sites to ensure access? For indigenous communities? 
you know, when we were looking at um, doing just that, you know, I think that we got a best practices guide that came out just a year ago, December in 2023, for federal agencies regarding tribal native Native Hawaiian sacred sites, really set the the standard by which we're all following to ensure that we are that we are protecting those sacred sites. That when we are talking with tribes, we are also wanting to protect their sites in a way where we don't have to give that information out to the general public. And that's that was usually the, the sticking point. Tribes really wanted those sites protected, but they knew if they had to, many times they were mapped out and that anybody then, and then, you know, you have to worry about everything from uh, grave diggers and, you know, fortune hunters. Um, under this new guidance we, and under the law, we are now able to restrict that information just to those who need it within government that are working directly with the tribes to protect those resources, those cultural resources, so that they will not become damaged, that they will be preserved. We've also been doing a lot more training with our own law enforcement. The National Park Service has two types of law enforcement. We have ranger law enforcement, which are the traditional ranger uniform officers. Uh, they are badged officers. They are they look more and act like uh, county sheriffs, if you will. Uh, that's probably their, their best comparison. But what's interesting about ranger law enforcement out in the national parks is that they are truly also responsible for as wildland firefighters, uh, EMS, first responders, uh, search and rescue. And so they wear uh, a lot of different hats uh, under their big Mountie, Mountie hat there that they have and responsibilities that they have. But that being said, they've also been getting a lot more training in cultural resource protection. And what does that mean? And doing cross training with tribes and having tribal uh, law enforcement come on to help them understand what they also do on reservation lands, especially where those reservation lands abut national park lands and how they protect them. And then we have the U.S. Park Police. Uh, the United States Park Police, which is more of an urban force, still does a number of projects and also works on understanding how to protect cultural values um, with tribes, and they've been doing themselves up, up. You know, I have a police force that numbers just around uh, 2,200 op officers uh, in the National Park Service. Wow, wonderful. Uh, thank you. So my second question from, again, a law student research fellow with the Native Environmental Sovereignty Project is, um, actually, this person is, is I guess, fellow with the uh, uh, another project, the Food Resiliency Project of our center, and asks, I am interested in how the National Park Service treats native plants. How does NPS protect and ensure access to native plants that could be used for cultural, medicinal, and culinary purposes? Are there any efforts to care for these plants in co-stewardship with indigenous communities? You know, a number of our co-stewardship agreements are around native plant propagation. You know, the, probably the foremost uh, experts on this actually came from uh, Acadia National Park and working with the main tribes and figuring out how to protect and preserve sweet grass. There was very hesitancy when I came on board. I actually went up to go look at that project. Uh, a lot of our science staff don't understand the words about reciprocation and relationship with plants. And so we worked with the tribes to help do a lot of training on what did that mean. And there was still hesitation as we were trying to propagate more sweetgrass. But once they understood and went out with a number of tribal elders and saw how they did propagation versus how we do greenhouse propagation, where they're actually taking native broodstock out in the field, taking it and singing to the plants and bringing those plants into fields that they, our staff kept saying, oh, sweetgrass doesn't grow there. And the tribal people saying, it grew there for thousands of years until this landscape got changed. We've now uh, vastly improved sweetgrass production on Acadia National Park. We use them as the basis of the model to upgrade in our uh, native plant um, uh, policies that did go out that were recently published uh, this last year, in which it uh, now says that we will work with tribes to bring their indigenous knowledge, and that before we begin a planning process, before we actually do any planning around propagation, that we have the tribes of the local area sit down with their staff first and tell us if they understand the propagation should be, so that we're not doing what used to happen to me as a tribal administrator, and we used to try call drive-by consultation, where the government was just going to tell us what they're going to do and whether we want to comment on it. We want tribes at the table saying, what do you want to do, and then how does that fit with us together so that we're working hand-in-hand -hand on these types of propagation issues? Uh, that I can't resist um, tossing in my own add-on question to what you just said. The drive-by consultation that is so typical of many federal agencies and has been for so long, 
Are you making an impact um, across other agencies with your approach? You know, it, most recently I was up at Voyagers National Park and we are on a process of looking at how we want to do um, tribal interpretation and visitor use management from the tribe's perspective. And I showed up with uh, about $1.8 million to the table and I met with the tribal leadership. There's 25 different tribes in the area. About half of them came to a dinner. And then I said to them, you know, we are looking forward. I'm very happy. We've hired a couple of liaisons to work with you. And then we will be holding meetings for you to all tell us what you want to do uh, under this rubric of the and bring us your ideas. I had four tribal chairmen going, okay, but what, what do you want to do? What What's your plan? What is the government <laughs> telling us we have to do? I'm like, I'm not saying you, I'm not telling you you have to do anything. I'm literally coming up. This is your $1.8 million to start developing the plan on how you want to want it developed. And to a chair, uh, they kept saying, this is a paradigm we were not used to or that we've not seen from the federal government. I credit President Biden, uh, Vice President Harris and Secretary Holland for really changing that paradigm to say for the first time, it is part of our trust responsibility to ask what the tribes want to do rather than telling the tribes what we're going to do. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to some of the questions that are coming in from the uh, audience. And first want to assure there's a couple questions about how we can get a recording of, of the entire presentation and that will be um, posted on our event website page, uh, the same page people used to log into this event. Uh, so here's a question for students in general and native students in particular, what are the best pathways to work in the National Park Service to ensure that we are extending indigenous vision throughout the system? You know, we are on a mass recruitment. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, has allowed us to bring in 1,500 people over a, a three and a half year period, uh, and the funding carries out uh, for a total of a 10 year period. And so we're just now into what, a little about year one and a half, um, and we've only recruited about a third of the positions that we're looking for. For the first time, the National Park Service has always relied for people to come and do seasonal jobs predominantly, which means you had to have some means in order to get into a park to even do a seasonal job uh, because they didn't pay very well. And so many times you had to be subsidized by somebody or you had to have the money in order to do so, or you lived in your car or in the park in a tent. For the first time, we're actually uh, rather have a looked at the pays that we need to pay people who are coming in to seasonal work, but more importantly, we are actually recruiting people where they're at. So we, for the first time, we have 32 recruiters that are all across the country that are going to uh, historic black, historically black colleges, uh, in native universities, native communities, into trade schools, uh, and into outlying uh, communities beyond the gateway communities of the park to recruit a more diverse workforce for that next generation of stewards. And so if they go to USA Jobs, they'll see a number of openings that are for everything from uh, early jobs that you can get in uh, with, the, you know, straight out of college if you're coming out of college, uh, to some that are that are actually more, more senior uh, in the parks. But now is a great time to start looking for those opportunities. The more quick way is actually to join one of the Youth Corps programs. And we run a number of Youth Corps programs. I myself, started my career in Oregon Youth Conservation Corps in 1987. And I tell every Corps member I meet, one day you too can become the National Park Service Director. The National Park Service Director, work, the, the National Park Service works with numerous youth corps all around the country, but we have direct hire authority with those youth corps and particularly the ones that are the native youth corps, where if they do a year of service, they will receive the certification to be able to be hired on into a position immediately rather than having to necessarily compete as you would through all others because you've already proven to us that you know the work, you've done the work, and you would be a good hire for us. Wonderful. Uh, another question came in, can National Park Service, first of all, after thanking you for your presentation, can National Park Service require all national parks to allow the use of tribal IDs, identification? for entrance to the parks. Some allow this and others do not. It would they be a do. great policy to require all parks to invite indigenous people back to their homelands by only showing their tribal IDs. That's all they have to do. Uh, that memo already went out. We just have to keep reminding folks. And sometimes we get new um, fee agents who are standing or gate agents who are 
the Rangers at the gates, and some of them have not saw the, seen the memo. So each year now, it was one of the very first memos that I sent out when I became the National Park Service Director. Any federally, any tribal member from a federally recognized tribe only need to show their tribal ID to get into any national park that has a fee. Okay. Um, let's see, this question, <clears throat> uh, again, thanking you for your remarks. Could you please talk a bit more about what the existing co-stewardship agreements look like, including lessons learned from them for making new co-stewardship agreements even better? So when I came on, of course, the National Park Service, like any other government agency, has standard agreements. What we had to charge them with is to use that only as the beginning framework, but have the tribes tell us if this will work for them. So there are agreements over those 100 of them are very unique, usually to the tribe because we have to look at what, what is the usual custom rights the tribe has? What has been their relationship with the federal government to date? Are they an executive order tribe? And then we, we form those agreements based on those relationships rather than coming up with a cookie cutter effect. I'm very cognizant of the Indian Reorganization Act of the 1930s. We got cookie cutter constitutions for those of us who decided to become constitutional governments or business councils. And so coming to this job, I wanted to ensure that there was more flexibility given into that process. And so as we develop co-stewardship agreements with tribes or annual funding agreements, it is done now truly on a nation to nation basis in which both sides can negotiate that and put the languages that they wanna see. Now, I'm not saying that we haven't had issues with that, you know, because we have uh, solicitors, my lawyers, I have a lot of them uh, who are traditionally trained and some of them didn't fully recognize that um, they would be given the latitude by which to do it. And usually when I ask my solicitors after I've given a policy, uh, I ask only two questions. Is this legally sufficient and will you protect me in court? If you answer yes to both those questions, then the policy decision is made and we can go forward with those plans of those projects and in this case, those stewardship agreements. So I might add on to this question as well, because um, years ago I did some research in self-governance agreements um, for co-management of national parks, and they were limited um, at the time. There were a handful. Um, and so those were four tribes with self-governance programs. Um, is the vision to use stewardship agreements more as, um, more as a means, an avenue for extending the covenant across all national parks? I keep coming back to the vision of the covenant. Is that more of a flexible mechanism for extending the covenant literally um, across the national parks and do the former more self-governance uh, structures still exist? Yes, so we can do everything from in those co-stewardship agreements to um, annual funding agreements to 638 contracting. And so I wanted to make sure that we had a number of flexible tools. And so to the previous question, yes, we are actually doing best management practices by doing examples of that. Most recently, we've been doing trainings. The, the My Native American Affairs staff have been doing trainings in each of the regions about the different tools that they can use in order to get to a co-stewardship agreement, or even in some cases to a co-management agreement where there is federal law that allows us to get into those. Um, and 638 contracting, when I first came in, you're right, there were only a handful of 638 contracting. We've now went, I think, from the three we had to nearly a dozen, and we're building on that, for, especially for the self-government tribes and who can come in and fulfill that. The issue we have is that is teaching superintendents and regional directors um, that it's okay to give up a federal responsibility once in a while. That's what they're always worried about. If if we allow that to happen, uh, that was an inherent federal responsibility, uh, we can't do that. And yet, in our good neighbor policies that we have with states and counties, we do just that. Mm -hmm. We allow them in our good neighbor policy sometimes, we contract out with the state to do snow removal. Well, that was predominantly a inherent federal responsibility within those federal reserve lands, national parks, with our own equipment, but in our good neighbor policies that we have with them, we actually just contract that out with the state. I said, it's no different than what you're doing then with the tribe, if the tribe wants to do snow removal. It's interesting how you change that mindset. I also had to remind my staff that when they took their oath of office to uphold the Constitution of the United States, just like I did, that also meant that they needed to uphold the treaty rights and the executive order responsibilities. For many of them, they've never been told that in their career. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, the next question uh, is this. The Indian Wars, in quotes, were waged from 1791 to 1890. Yellowstone was expropriated from native control in 1872. If Vladimir Putin annexed or expropriated the Donbass region by declaring it a national park, the developed world would see it for what it was, a war crime. Why do we not view national parks as an act of war during wartime in a war crime? That's a great question. <laughs> Maybe when I live in the National Park Service, I'll do a law paper on that. Um, <laughs> I don't know. That is a good question. It's one that's worth exploring. It's one worth debating and talking about and proving itself out. Okay. Um, another question. Is the National Park Service currently working with any non-federally recognized tribes, or does it plan to do so in the future? Thank you so much for lecture, this person says. Yes. Uh, and the secretary order, it not only tells us to, of course, fulfill our trust responsibilities, it tells us that we must continue to talk with those tribes who are seeking federal recognition. And so whether they are state recognized or otherwise, we are figuring out where we can have those conversations and what are the legal means and tools that are at our disposal and helping them uh, ensure that they have their connection to their traditional homelands. It's a little more complex, of course. Those who are state recognized tribes, it's a little bit easier versus those who have no recognition. And so like in the tribes in California where the state doesn't recognize any non-federally recognized tribes, it is can be difficult, but not impossible. Most recently, I did the Tamal Crossing um, out through the channels um, in California and uh, visiting with the Chumash people. And as you know, there's only a handful of federally recognized. And so the majority of the people that were out on the Channel Islands were not federally recognized and not even state recognized. But we talked together about how they're able to influence their federal, federally recognized relatives to do cultural protection, to continue to have their dances and their way of life and their practices on those islands um, and, and how they can be able to harness their tribal that is a federal partner with us to do so and how they have influence in those discussions because they attend those meetings when we're having about how we're protecting native plants how are we protecting natural resources how are we propagating um, uh, the the you know the small little foxes that live out on the islands uh, all those things they still have influence then on uh, because they are able to harness their relationship with the tribe that does have federal recognition wonderful um, I will take more questions from the audience, but um, until another one comes in, I, I have the, <laughs> the great uh, gift of being able to ask my own. Um, so what a pleasure. Um, I'm interested in carbon drawdown across National Park Service lands. I'm doing a, a big project here at University of Oregon focusing on how we can um, create sort of a bridge to carbon sequestration across working lands in the Pacific Northwest and other lands as well. Um, and so in that vein, to what extent is the Park Service um, thinking about using its own lands um, in ways that will accelerate carbon drawdown naturally? And I guess an, another add on to that question might be, um, to what extent might tribal indigenous knowledge inform those efforts? Yes to both. So most recently, um, this last year, we republished um, an update to our climate adaptation resiliency plan, um, a strategic plan, which took in consideration of carbon, especially in our forested areas and our wild grasslands. And um, as part of um, our ecosystem recovery, you know, uh, of those keystone species, grasslands is a key, key component of that for the department. Uh, and so I've been working very closely with my friends at Bureau of Land Management, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Reclamation, and where our federal lands have butt together to talk about that so that we can do and capture carbon. Uh, a great place of that is at the Great Sand Dunes, in which you have three wildlife refuges all the way around, plus the Great Sand Dunes. We have native grasslands on there. How are we going to reintroducing bison to that landscape so that they can act and propagate those grasslands to come back in a full way? And then what are we doing around carbon sequestration uh, to do so that we have that that scrubbing process. Yes, that's all part of the larger strategic plan. And then more importantly, um, I'm talking with my fellow bureau heads so that we are doing ecosystem restoration on a true large scale and we're not competing with each other, but actually we're, what are our strengths and what are our weaknesses and where can we help each other in restoration of these projects? 
Well, what's amazing to hear from you is is this role you are playing in uh, really bringing other bureau heads into in, into this um, sort of community of leadership. And uh, is that is that something new? It seems to be. It, it is. Gen the, our staffs are really surprised at how closely Tracy Stone Manning, the head of Bureau of Land Management, Martha Williams, the head of U.S. Fish and Wildlife, uh, Camille Tootin, the head of Bureau of Reclamation, uh, we're all friends and we've all met each other in some different places and we were all fighting the government at some point that they're not paying attention, you know, the, the different bureaus weren't talking to each other. And so right. when we all came in, we all went to dinner and made a con made a pact amongst ourselves that we're not interested in competing with each other when federal dollars coming in. We're not interested in one person, you know, any glory. What can we do together and how can we get our staffs to work together to protect all of these landscapes in a much larger scale? And if we are going to do ecosystem restoration, whether that's on the landscape or seascape scale, what are we doing and how are we talking with each other? And so we meet regularly just ourselves to talk about that. What are our challenges? What are what are what is working well for best management practices? And how do we continue to promote staff, our different staffs working together? And so when I was doing my final review of my climate change strategy update, you know, I sent it around to my colleagues and said, do you have anything that you see that you're doing that we're doing differently that we should be adding? And they've done the exact same back to me. Martha Williams sends me over her plans on ecosystem restoration uh, with monarch butterflies and says, what is your component in this and helping to ensure that continuity uh, as we're working throughout the West uh, to restore monarch butterflies and other pollinators? Um, yes, the staff were very surprised at how, how this happened because in government, you know, we're used to working in silos and I, I saw all those missed opportunities over 30 years before I came back into federal service because people were too worried about working in their silos rather than picking their heads up and looking across and saying, what are you doing over there and how can I help do that or what can I do better? Um, and yeah, it's been a different paradigm. But I also credit the leadership of Secretary Holland, who expects us to be collegial, who expects us to work in partnership and to work as friends uh, and not as competitors. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, here's another question from the audience. How do you see the role of the National Park Service in promoting indigenous stewardship in Puerto Rico, given its ongoing status as a U.S. territory? There's uh, the Tiana people that are still exist in the mountains, you know, uh, done down there to visit. We believe that they still play an important part. They understand some of the ecosystem function that happens uh, on restoration of those forest lands. You know, I've worked very closely with the Forest Service uh, and how they're doing that interpretation of indigenous knowledge in Puerto Rico. And then we've been able to, because of their context and their forest practices, about how then are we imagining the parklands that we do have in, in Puerto Rico itself too. Great. Here's another question. Uh, beginning with the story of coyote and the monster, uh, the story of coyote and the monster that was a stunning example of the way ways in which indigenous stories carry knowledge of human connection and responsibility to and with the land and set the framework for the purpose of the national park service itself how do you see the national park service engaging in bringing stories back to the land particularly as oral tradition as well as sources of knowledge and you may have touched on this a little bit before, but maybe you could expand on it. No, I mean, we are, we're asking, you know, I, I, when I'm talking with uh, my staff, I said, when you were bringing the tribes, ask them what their own creation story is and their understanding and relationship to the land. There is some concern, mostly by an older generation that, you know, this isn't science. This isn't, you know, these are just myths. So are as much of many, many religious cultures around the world are beginning in myths and not necessarily, you know, the, the science. The idea of uh, manifest destiny is not based in science. It's placed in a religious belief that is not, to me, a reality. I mean, it happened to us based on somebody believing that they had dominance over me and over my landscape. Um, but we still tell that story in the park service. It's still a story. It's a national story we tell. That story can st stand just alongside our creation stories. Telling those stories and having two different ideals, um, and they may be uh, running in parallel, is not should not be an issue for us as we continue to tell those stories more fiercely. Again, it's about being able to everybody to see themselves in their parks. I have uh, two final questions if we have time. We only have about four minutes left. 
Um, one is, does the Park Service um, ever envision a proposal to perhaps Congress to um, to to make new tra national trails that are perhaps historic? I'm thinking of the Nez Perce uh, 1877 trail, um, which is not you know a block of land that goes through a bunch of private lands, and there would have to be conservation easements or access easements or whatever. Does the Park Service engage in that kind of visioning to augment the system through sort of outside the box tools, if you will? Yes, and we've had those discussions. As I began my career 30 plus years ago in uh, trail work is what I started in as an Oregon Youth Conservation Corps. And so my hearts are always with trails and the trail folks that it both uh, have in staff and our partners around the country. You know, the Ice Age Trail, we made, you know, a national historic trail. We were able to, I was able to make that a declaration. So we are looking at those that have already been made by Congress. How can we uplift those? How can we get more money to them? How can we talk about those extended stories? Uh, but most of our trails are actually the interstate highway system. They're paved. <laughs> As I point out to people, those were the original commerce trails that went northeast, southwest. Those aren't just happenstance that were surveyed by the United States government. Those are the original inner commerce trails uh, that we have. And so there's a chance for us to uplift those stories along the way and working with the federal highways, who's also interested in how we tell those stories and how they can tell those stories better. Very interesting. Well, we only have um, a couple more questions, uh, minutes, I'm sorry. Um, let's see, here's here's a question that just came in. As a follow-up question to earlier mention of upgrading security pro protocols for culturally sensitive documentation, I'm curious if you might discuss how public and professional partners involved intimately in this type of work can interface with best practices and confidentiality as we work with park archeologists and similar staff in and around protected sites. So uh, the Office of Native American Affairs is, as I said, we're doing a bunch of best management practices because all these are coming in line and we're realizing that we need to share this also with our federal, other federal partners, but how can we share it with state and other communities about how we do this? And that is one of the topics that they're looking that they want to get to, especially how do you protect um, culturally sensitive information in a respectful way, but also allow it so that those in the field can do the research necessary to know how to better protect these sites and share that information between the tribes and the federal agencies and in some cases the states including state historic preservation officers which you know are funded through the national park service well we have um uh, about 30 seconds left just enough time for me to thank you again so much for appearing as our renard strickland lecture you have really um given the whole series such such uh, a great gift and and it's been such an honor to host this uh, on my part thank you so much and thank you for the entire team that helped put this on and thank you to the audience and please access the recording and spread it far and wide with that good afternoon everybody and thank you again director sands thank you professor it's such an honor to, act, to be invited to do this lecture and uh, i look forward to seeing you soon i i so do too Bye-bye.